Good evening, good afternoon, good morning from uh, wherever you're joining us uh, today. Welcome to this uh, episode of uh, the Africa Football uh, Business Show, where we try to create conversations that will shape uh, the football industry uh, on the continent. Uh, today we have a very crucial subject to, to discuss, uh, education through football, a model uh, for Africa. And uh, we have two excellent guests, uh, professionals with uh, vast experience in the field, uh, to unpack uh, these, uh, these topics for us. Uh, but before we go ahead, I would just like to uh, appreciate our, our sponsors, uh, partners, that's uh, OTB Africa, uh, Palmas, and uh, see beyond the uh, leadership uh, forum. And uh, also to recognize our collaborator, uh, collaborators in organizing this uh, show, uh, that is uh, sports uh, uh, legal. Uh, so as I said, we have uh, two great gentlemen who have vast, vast experience in the field of football uh, on the continent, the field of sports. And uh, I will just uh, go straight ahead and um, uh, introduce them, uh, starting with uh, Professor uh, Oscar uh, Mwanga, joining us uh, all the way from uh, Southampton uh, in the UK. Uh, Professor Mwanga is a pioneer in the sport for development uh, uh, field and is um, internationally recognized as, the, as a thought leader uh, on the same. He's also uh, an entrepreneur and has co-founded various organizations. And uh, recently, uh, they've uh, launched the Edimove uh, app. This is a physical, uh, an app that combines uh, physical fun uh, exercises with transformative education uh, for the globe. Um, Career-wise, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Oscar Moanga is a pro program director of international sports uh, management uh, currently at the University of London and also is an uh, Emirates Associate Professor at the Solent University in, uh, in Southampton. So welcome, uh, Professor uh, Mwanga. Uh, with us as well, we have uh, uh, Tom Vannon. Um, uh, Tom Vannon, uh, a football coach and sports entrepreneur is a former Manchester United scout, and we hope to hear more uh, more of that. It's one of the biggest club uh, biggest clubs in the in the world. Um, in 1999, uh, Tom moved to to Ghana, where he set up uh, the Right to Dream Academy to provide talented Africans with an opportunity to fulfill their potential and capacity to claim a better future, not only for themselves but for their communities and country. Uh, in 2015, uh, Tom also uh, uh, purchased uh, a club in, uh, in Denmark. Uh, we'll hear more about this, uh, FC Northland, where he currently serves as, uh, as chairman. And um, recently, they've uh, received a very good uh, investment from the, from the Man Capital um, Group in, uh, in Egypt. And this has led to the expansion of uh, the right, uh, right to dream. It's now right to dream uh, group, uh, right, Tom, and uh, with the cannabis in Denmark uh, and Egypt, and uh, soon to venture uh, in the in the UK. So, right to dream has graduated over 60, 60 talents who are now playing professional football around the world, and a further eighty students, at least athletes, placed in various institutions. Uh, mainly in the UK and the US, so some good work um, here. So going into the, the subject of uh, today, education through football. You know, football is uh, what we are all passionate about, and um, recently we have more, more and more organizations, more and more people coming up and emphasizing the importance of education, especially for football players and other sports, uh, sports people. So I'll just pose a question to, to both of you. I mean, you have a combined experience of, um, of 40 years in football sports development on the African continent. From a personal uh, perspective, what has been the greatest moment or the greatest uh, fulfillment in your work on the continent? We'll start with you, Tom. Uh, there's been uh, there's been so many moments and um, it, it's definitely hard to, to put a figure on one but I think especially as we're uh, 
you know, as we're focusing on education at the moment, um, to see uh, see one of our students who we, you know, discovered in 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 Wagadougou, in in you know, in the typical um, uh, African young African footballer uh, situation, now attending you know Stanford University and 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 playing for you know maybe the biggest university in the world, but also excelling so far in education and and then to have replicated that on the girls side um and and to see girls coming through now studying to be lawyers and 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 the like in some of the world's leading universities is really satisfying and you know if we if if we go if we go down the football track and we start talking about the you know the challenges that you have in football with with agents and transfers and all this kind of stuff which can sometimes muddy the enjoyment that you get from developing a youngster. I think when when we look at this uh, education track, then it feels a little bit more pure. And and the you know the kind of the the, the deal between you and, and 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 students when they go on an educational track is clearer and more more transparent, and so is is more satisfying. I think so. As you mentioned, you know we've we've had so many students. We've raised over fifty million dollars in scholarships for. For, for kids from right to dream to go and and when we talk about the replication of the academy in Egypt now with a, a huge investment there from uh, Mr. Mohammed Mansour the reason that he chose to invest in right to dream when he decided he was going to invest in football was the educational emphasis that we have at right to dream rather than any kind of compelling business model in the uh, on the football side, we all know that it's a it's a tricky model um, on the professional football side. But for him and and his family, who are all educated in America as well, to see that we've created a well trodden pathway now, where young students from across the continent can um, can access what what you know specifically America has to offer in terms of student athlete experiences, was the reason that he made such a big investment. So, I think um, you know. That's where a lot of my pride and satisfaction lies in in what's been achieved over um, over the last twenty two years. Excellent, congratulations, uh, Tom. Uh, we'll uh, get uh, more details uh, as we as we move along. What about you, Oscar? What has kept you motivated to stay in the field despite the obvious challenges, especially on the African continent? Well, to start with, I just want to express my my thank you for the opportunity to to, to speak on your on, on your program, uh, Brian, and also to just uh, congratulate you because I think it's a uh, it's a tremendous effort that you've made. I find your channel as something that is very disruptive in the business. Uh, it gives an opportunity for uh, a progressive conversation that hopefully begins to shape uh, Africa in a different di direction. Uh, and also, it, it allows voices such as mine that have that are not normally privileged to speak um, in, in, in this big uh, football industry as we know it. But um, you know, coming to the question, what has uh, you know kept me going? So, unlike uh, you know, at home, I am no longer actively involved uh, in, in, in football. I am more a, 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 an activist in uh, sport for development. Uh, I work um, within the the walls of the university, which is quite a protected space. But um, looking back at uh, my involvement, maybe I would say football is, as a business, can be a very challenging business. Uh, some people have called it a dark space sometimes in terms of agents, uh, in terms of the lives that can be distracted even as you're trying to do the right thing. But I'd like to say that uh, I've had moments, um, if, I, if I can just package the moments and say, in terms of uh, education, which is what we're talking about, we've, uh, or from the turn of the century in 1999, when I got involved to set up the Age of Foundation in Zambia, we have built uh, a number of schools, primary schools, uh, giving opportunities to uh, young people that couldn't have a chance to go to school. Uh, we have given opportunities uh, like the case of Tom as well, to many young people to become teachers, uh, to become uh, you know uh, medical practitioners. Uh, currently, one of our pride uh, achievements is that the football director at uh, at, at the Zambian FA, uh, Lyson Zulu, is a product of of, of the Edgesport Foundation system, and uh, he did his degree at Loughborough University. 
and uh, he's just been doing fantastic work. Uh, and uh, the the leader of the women program, the, the manager for the women program, is also Ani Namkanga, coming out of the, the great tradition of education at Edu Sport. Uh, so we also have other impacts that have been uh, felt in the community. So we drove uh, an Ubuntu community uh, uh, approach, which means uh, we hope that our work would positively impact the community so that it became, um, you know, people that were more mindful of the, the progress of not just individuals, but the wider community. So um, at Edu Sport, we started a policy that was looking at decentralizing our, our, our academy. So we supported a lot of community-based academies and they today have become thriving academies uh, where examples of Busa, uh, Baoleni, uh, United Sports Academy, uh, uh, Blue Bullets, uh, you have Africa on the ball. All these young people that came from the edge of sport as young peer leaders have gone to set up these academies and, and, and enriched a wide uh, uh, impact in the community. So coming to our impact in football, uh, my, one of my proud moments is the fact that uh, the Chipotle 2012 uh, 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 champions had uh, four players coming out of from the uh, Edge Sport uh, Academy, um, which is fantastic. And I think one of them is joining us today, uh, William Njogu, who is a midfielder. Um, and um, the the leaders of our, our women program went on to produce fantastic players in the community. And uh, so Zambia is, for the first time, sending a women's team to the Olympics. And four of those players are coming from one of the uh, academies that, uh, you, know, it, you know, grew from the Edge Sport uh, Foundation. So great moments and, uh, you know, great stories. And I'm sure we, we, we'll share those stories. But I, I'm just, it's been an honor for me to be part of this uh, tradition. And, uh, yeah, thank you. Excellent, uh, uh, Professor Moanga. We'll, we'll just stay with you for, for uh, as we um, continue with the show. We know Africa is teeming with talent. You have just uh, mentioned, uh, for example, uh, Edu Sport had four players in the 2012 Chipolo Polo team that won the Africa Cup of Nations. And you go all over uh, uh, Zambia, all over Africa. I think this is also something that inspired uh, Tom to come to, uh, to, come, uh, to Africa. It's teeming with talent and this has led to the to the growth the proliferation of, of football academies across the continent many of them with the aim of providing um players providing young people with the opportunity to play football at the top level uh but we are well aware that uh, the opportunities are limited at the elite level just some statistics from the UK, for example, out of uh, the 1.5 million kids who are engaged in um, uh, organized youth football, only 180, that is 0.012%, will make it to the Premier League. Just let that sink for a bit. What does this mean for a continent like Africa where even at the elite level, it is difficult for players to earn a living uh, from the sport. What, what are some of the challenges, risks that we face in uh, trying to groom players for the football labor market? Well, um, I'd like to say, to start with, uh, the idea that uh, you can sell a dream in that kind of statistic, uh, for me, is, uh, is, is, is not what... Uh, you know, we should be doing, we should be selling a dream for the community. Uh, we should be selling a dream for, um, you know, for, 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 for the continent. And I think that's why I, I, I like this uh, duo approach that we have at Edge Sport and I believe they have at, uh, at, at Dare to Dream, which is to say, you know, football is very attractive. You, you can see the big dream, but very few people are going to make it. Therefore, uh, we, we, we package it together with education. We package it together with uh, the community uh, aspect. Now, there's a, there's, a, there's a great saying in Africa that says, uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go as a community. Now, that comes out of this tradition of uh, 
the African, uh, Sub-Saharan African uh, ideology of Ubuntu, that we move as a community. Now, this was, for me, that has been an inspiration when I started to work in this. I, I come from a, a time in, uh, in, in history when we were inspired by the four founders of, 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 of uh, the African continent, the Pan-African movement, uh, in the names of Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, the Kwame Nkrumah, uh, you know, the, the Mwalimu Nyerere. They gave us this vision of an Africa that is united, not an Africa that one person goes away and does well and then leaves everyone behind. They, they, they fought for this continent that would be united. And uh, today it's translated in, 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 the, in the Africa we want, which is a, a, a blueprint policy document by the African Union that says, you know, we, we need to move together to prosper together. Uh, so this idea of, of football sometimes works against the grain of the, the, the community drive. And it becomes dangerous when you the only thing you package is, 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 is the football. Um, if you balance it with the education, there is a chance that if it doesn't work in football, it can work uh, in education. Now, that becomes difficult to, over the years for me, it was a very difficult thing to, to, to promote because uh, the young people are very convinced that they'll be the next thing. Uh, the families sometimes are convinced they'll be the next thing. Uh, and before you know it, you have got agents uh, entering the, the space and it gets really complicated. I have I've had very terrible experiences in terms of uh, agents uh, that, that work with us and I, I can give a few examples. So if I give the example of, uh, uh, you know, I'm sure he's happy for me to do this, uh, Lyson Zulu who works for the football uh, uh, FA in Zambia as a director. He was quite talented, but not as talented as players that made it in the national team. So he, he, in terms of football, his game was getting better because he was in the space of really talented pe people. But we developed uh, a program that allowed Lyson to go in the community as what we call a peer leader. So he coached a younger a group of, of, of youngsters and then he got a qualification as a, as a peer coach. That gave him uh, you know, extra badges to become a leader. But then we said, if you did that in your community, would pay for your education. So we paid for his education. And he had to work with the parents. And we were lucky that his parents believed his guardians because he was an orphan. His guardians believed in, uh, in, in education. And it was very easy for us to work uh, with, with Lyson. And he would go on to, to, to get a scholarship in the UK and uh, through uh, partners that we worked with and through the work that I was engaged with at Loughborough, he, he managed to get a scholarship to go to Loughborough. But there were other players that were very convinced that they would be the next uh, thing and their parents did not support education. So I can't mention names, but we have a player right now where me and Lyson are constantly on the phone trying to find out how we can support him. He's got no health insurance. Uh, he had played uh, for a top club in Europe. Uh, he had been to Real Madrid for a trial. He's, he's now struggling with alcoholism. He's now struggling with uh, trying to keep his family together. So, you know, the good heart that we try to promote as a community is the one that takes us back to him. This time we don't see him as a football player. We see him as a human, uh, a full human being within the idea of, of Ubuntu. Now, uh, I just want to say a little bit about Ubuntu. Ubuntu is this um, African uh, worldview that says, I am because we are. It is this fundamental belief that we are together. We, we, without one another, we're not a complete human. Now, for me, it has been an opportunity to implement that as part of our education program, that we remind each other that this is what we do together. So one of the uh, interesting, uh, you know, life-changing moments was seeing how these young people in some of the communities who worked, um, you know, even supported each other when, uh, you know, some of their friends went to, to hospital or ended up, uh, you know, uh, you know, as, as uh, you know, just killed in very mysterious circumstances. And they've been there at funerals, running the whole funeral. So for me, those were the, the, the great moments of the education. So this is not just academic education. This is education of, of the African Ubuntu that says that we are a community. Now, the challenge is that that idea of Ubuntu translated into edge sport has to compete against a global system of things, which is neoliberal. Uh, where it's all about money. And, and, and sometimes when agents come into the space, you see that even the good-hearted people that are trying to foster this approach of Ubuntu, for instance, are 
you know, uh, can't, you know, they can't, they can't stay in that space and they, they, they give in. So for this particular player that I can't mention his name, um, my vice chairman went behind my back and took him to a club in North Africa without my permission. Uh, that was about 2008. And uh, we were forced to sign, sign him away within 48 hours because his parents began to call us to put us under pressure that we were blocking the young man to go over. We had already been in conversation with uh, FC Basel at the time. So um, because these agents went behind our back, we only managed to get $30,000 from that sale, a selling of 10,000. And within six months, he had gone over to FC Basel at 900,000 euros. Now that's the money we needed to inject back into the community so that we can create opportunities uh, for scholarships for other players in the way that uh, they are to dream has done. But I'd like to say here that um, we couldn't continue the academy. The academy is now continuing uh, through community-based academies like the ones I've mentioned. But I, my pride is that they have continued to do this work, but it is tough work because the, the order of things does not favor Africa. The, the global order of things does not favor Africa. Um, so here's an example. Um, the we'll, uh, we'll uh, get uh, back into, in, uh, into some of the details. Let's just bring Tom in uh, uh, a bit, you know, um, with uh, lots of experience across uh, Africa. I'm sure you faced uh, uh, similar challenges and also, Tom, you're working towards placing um, uh, players not only in clubs abroad, but also in universities and um, and colleges. What inspired you uh, to set up uh, this model, the model that you have at uh, at Right to Dream? What what inspired this? What is it that you observed on the continent in uh, in the twenty years that inspired you to set up Right to Dream in the way it is set up now? I think um, a lot of things inspired me, but but, but one which is of particular re relevance is. Uh, is my friend is now the now uh, president George Weir, and um, you know when he, uh, you know when I talked to him about the ideas and and what I wanted to do with the academy, and he talked to me about how Nelson Mandela had um, inspired him that the role of an African footballer was different to uh, the role of a footballer in another part of the world, which is what I think Oscar is talking about with with Ubuntu, which is as we know originated in in, in South Africa as well. Um, is is that you can take more responsibility and you can have a, a more holistic role within society as a as 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 an athlete, especially in Africa, because of the role model status and and the the construct that we have in the village about the, the way that uh, we all lift each other and and we don't go in our own direction. And so, you know, I arrived from uh, you know from Europe with a more classical European football training about how academies should be constructed and. And really saw very quickly that that um, that European construct was uh, certainly uh, not relevant for Africa, where you simply can't tell a child after six months or twelve months of bad performance that he should go home in the way that they do in in, in European academies. And so, you know, that that led to say, well, how could we reimagine the academy to be relevant in the in the African context and I couldn't agree, you know, with Oscar more about, you know, his point, which is that we need to, we need to anchor our football industry and our football culture on original African values. And the fact is that we're we're, we're looking constantly to Europe and trying to replicate a model, uh, which we see uh, clearly is morally bankrupt. You know, the 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 issues of of mental health in academies and then the issues that we see of racism in the stadiums are reflections of 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 that moral bankruptcy and 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 what Africa really needs to do is to reimagine its own future in football and I think that the you know th these ideas that FIFA can impose structure organization and regulation on how we should organize our football is uh, is a concept of the past and we need to we need to uh, break out beyond that and and especially when we talk in education i can give a very clear example that you know fifa say for example that relegation and promotion is a key part of uh, of, of of your national football pyramid in america they don't agree so they don't do it and then um 
in, in, in America, they think that the student and the athlete should be developed, but developed until the age of 21, which we've seen in basketball and American football for, for many, many years. And in, and, and in football, FIFA, um, you know, really allow from 16 for children to, to, to depart from their education and, and to be much more focused on, on just their football. But these concepts and ideas have no relevance to the way that Africa needs to take its football future forwards. And um, I, I think that Ubuntu is the anchor for, on which uh, African football should design itself. And, and if, if it is designed on that premise, then it's very obvious that we will continue to educate our kids much longer than uh, maybe they choose to in Europe. And it, it, it is very obvious that we will uh, design rules that allow for sustainability of our clubs in the African context. And, you know, one of those sustainability issues is, is, is relegation. If, if you expect a club to put an academy uh, structure in place and to invest systematically over 10 or 15 years to build something, uh, you, you can't then expect these fledgling clubs to, to survive with the risk of losing a lot of their revenues because, because of a, a concept called relegation that's mandated from Europe. So, uh, you know, I think for me, you know, how did Right to Dream get the idea? It got the idea from knowing that Europe doesn't have the answers and that we could find the answers in Ghana and we could look into Ghanaian society to find answers for how to construct. And, and now, um, you know, now we have people from all over the world who want to come and visit and learn. And, and when we bought a club in Europe, we were very clear to say that it's right to dream an African academy that has purchased a club in Europe is the first time that it's, it's ever happened. And then we're coming uh, with ideas that have grown in Africa about how football development could work. And our European brothers and sisters in this academy are going to uh, uh, learn to develop themselves according to these ideas and philosophies. So, for example, in our club, um, it, uh, all of our Danish players go to Ghana before any of our Ghanaian players come to Europe. And they all go when they're 12 years old and they live in the typical Ghanaian construct. They wake up 5.30 for morning devotion. They wash their own clothes, which is a key principle in, in learning self-discipline in life that, that Europe has, has, has lost sight of. So I think my broad answer to the, to the question and the direction is that we need to be bold enough to design a future that is relevant for the African construct. And I think we need to accept the principle that there is very, very little that we have left to learn from the European game that is of relevance to um, to how we're going to design our own our own future in Africa. And uh, we can look in other places of the world where we'll find more relevance, like the student athlete in uh, in America. Uh, but but uh, also in South America, we might find many more relevant learnings than than we find in Europe. But because they export their uh, uh, football products so efficiently on TV. We seem to think that all the answers uh, lie there, and I think we need to uh, be more clear that it, that it's not going to take us uh, in the direction that we need to go. Excellent. You can, you can, you can see, Oscar, you want to come in on uh, on this, especially in uh, yeah, illustrating exactly how this uh, this concept of uh, Ubuntu can really be mainstreamed um, into the development of the football uh, sports ecosystem uh, in Africa. Yeah, just to share more about uh, your experience with, uh, with Edu Sports and also some of the challenges you have had in terms of expanding or replicating this model. You know, uh, it's only by coming to this show that now we know there's Edu Sport in Zambia. We probably have similar um, uh, setups in, uh, in other countries, but there's not, there's not much exchange uh, happening. What's, what's been your experience with Edu Sport, uh, Oscar? Okay, uh, I just want to pick up uh, from uh, some solid, strong points that uh, uh, Thomas made. Um, and I just want to say and, and sort of exemplify, look at uh, some examples. Uh, to start with, um, to promote any model, the people that are promoting it must believe in it. You, you cannot push it if you don't believe in it. Now, globally, Africa is not a place where it's perceived that we develop models. Africa is a place where we test things. Other people come from other parts of the world. 
to try out knowledges on Africa. And then because of the, 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 the colonial legacy, even in our education system, our people don't believe. So if we're going to come out of this, we're going to you know, have to listen to that song by Bob Marley, you know, emancipate yourself from uh, mental slavery. We have to emancipate ourselves. And, uh, and I'm glad that between myself and Tom, we have an example of how this can happen in football. Now, if you look at what uh, uh, Dare to Dream has done, you can actually make very interesting uh, parallel uh, explanations with what happens in other industries. Cocoa in Ghana. Why isn't Ghana a leading chocolate uh, producer in the world when they, they're the ones that make uh, in the, the, produce the cocoa? All right. So there is certain knowledge in Ghana. There are, there are certain inadequacies in Ghana that uh, don't allow them to beat Switzerland in chocolate production on the global stage. Now, if they begin to understand what that takes, then Ghanaians will start to disrupt that process the way I think Tom and his uh, program have disrupted. The idea that our players can go to, Af to Europe very young, we don't get much money even to support programs, but to have a club in Denmark, that's groundbreaking. That's a major disruption because Denmark is, 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 is outside the core of these big leagues, just the same way that um, you know, those that are in, 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 in mining, you find that the, the, the center of, of the metro exchange would be in, in, in England. So for you to understand how to disrupt that industry, you must understand what happens in England in terms of the, uh, the metro exchange. So that knowledge must be applicable. You must apply that knowledge and then begin to push. So it has to be disruption. That's the only way out of here. We have to look for new relationships. So when the disruption happens, we look for new relationships that can empower Africa because the old relationships, they leave Africa behind. The old relationships say Africa is not a place where there's innovation. Africa is not a place where we produce models so that our own people in Zambia, they didn't believe. You know, uh, When we sold players from our academy to uh, uh, Super League clubs, they didn't pass. They didn't buy the story of what we're trying to do. Our own people didn't buy that story. So how else do you think that this can go if people within the community don't believe in, in that? So the education system has to build confidence in innovation. The education system has to build confidence in what we can do. And I think here we have uh, examples of how uh, that, that can happen. And uh, it's up to us to begin to, to, to translate Ubuntu in, 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 in contemporary times. So Ubuntu is a very traditional uh, worldview that intersects with present times and present challenges. So it's important that our, uh, you know, our scholars, it's important that our activists are beginning to understand how that translation would happen in present times and in different industries. Sometimes I feel as though we've let down the forefathers of Africa. They gave us the big vision of Africa. I wish we had people in education that translated that in education. People in, in, in mining industry, people in agriculture, people in, in this case, those of us in sport, all of us were supposed to be little Mandelas, little Nyereres, little Kaundas in those silos so that we could begin to, to translate those. And uh, that's what we tried to do at, at, at Deju Sport. And I, I, I believe now, uh, having heard the story coming out of Ghana, that hopefully we can start to foster new relationships that will give us the empowerment to promote our models. Excellent, Oscar. Your your comments just uh, remind me. Uh, before this show, I was, I was watching the the, the, the story of uh, Osime uh, Osimo Buddha. Uh, I think for for our viewers here today, we would uh, recommend that they go on uh, on, on YouTube uh, to uh, watch um, uh, Osime Buddha, who is currently at uh, at Stanford uh, University, uh, being a graduate of uh, the Right to Dream Academy. And uh, in that boy, you see leadership. And that is, this is something that uh, we have struggled uh, with, especially in the, in the football um, ecosystem. Maybe, Tom, just to, to, to take you ahead, how, how, does, how is Right to Dream uh, trying, for example, to create the leaders of the future, especially in the football industry where we are, we are really lacking? Um, Tom, please. I think, um, uh, you know, really it's quite easy. Um, if, if you look at um, all of uh, Africa's football, um, their desire to, to give back and improve the communities that they come from has always been very strong. 
And, you know, the, the, the main reason that a lot of positive momentum has, um, has kind of faded away on that has been the lack of support. And when you, when you like send the money home for the programs or whatever, then there's always problems with it. But African footballers want to do more than any other footballers in the world, in, in my opinion. And quite sadly, a lot of them can tell you the amount of money they've lost. But then we can also see some fantastic examples with guys like uh, in Kanu and, and, and so on who have done tremendous things in terms of giving back on, on causes that they're passionate about. So obviously you need a strong formal academic base in order to be able to process and learn and understand the concepts of leadership. If you can't read books, advanced books, then there's going to be a link to, to, to where your leadership can go. But then beyond that, and what we focused on very much at Write Your Dream is, is what started as a character development program, but has now um, evolved into a football purpose and identity program. So we have to start by um, helping our footballers understand that their identity is not defined by uh, uh, them as a footballer. Often they, they struggle to imagine something beyond that because they've been defined from such a young age as, as a footballer and, and, and nothing else. So even with Hosseini, um, you know, uh, um, uh, when he went to Stanford, you know, I, I remember going to see him and having a, a, a long conversation with him where I asked him, did he really feel that he belonged there? And did he really feel that he had the right to be there? And, and he told me that, you know, from the age of 10 or 11, um, it was only about football. And even though he knows he's a smart guy, he still thinks of himself as a footballer at Stanford rather than a student at Stanford. And so we did the work on identity and 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 the fact that he's one of the exceptional students on campus and not just there. Uh, and then we had to role model some different people. And um, we looked at uh, Ache Leckie, who's the uh, uh, global, uh, the African um, principal for McKinsey, who's from Cameroon. And, and, and I asked him if he could imagine himself as someone like that in future and and he started to and started to redefine his identity and then envisage greater leadership capabilities that, that often that football construct restricts you in what you what you can imagine um, uh, you're capable of being in future. But in terms of the desire, um, you know, when we talk about this new uh, concept of purpose driven athletes, which we see with LeBron James and, and Serena Williams and, and Marcus Rashford, you know, there's no, and, and, and Colin Kaepernick is another great example. You know, there's no coincidence that, that there's a common thread in the ethnicity of the, the most prominent purpose-driven athletes in the world. Um, it's because they come from communities which ultimately anchor back to the principle of Ubuntu. And so when they get into these positions of authority and, 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 and platform, then they more easily use that platform to bring social change and to bring impact um, that they think is is relevant to the world. So it's actually much easier to talk to an African player about his responsibilities and future potential in leadership. And then you just have to um, work on identity for, for, for the players to imagine that they can be more than just footballers than it is in Europe. When you work with, um, with, with players in Europe, it, it's actually much, much harder to, to address some of these topics because they don't come from um, a, a society, as Oscar rightly pointed out, where um, where you know their heritage is anchored in a, in a concept like Ubuntu. So, I think this is another area where Africa has a tremendous potential for um, the brands of our athletes to be much more relevant to the consumer globally in the next twenty years. Because the fact is that the the young generation now are inspired by people like Greta Thunberg. They believe that, uh, that, that uh, people should stand up for social change. They're changing the narrative and the conversation. And the fact is that the athletes uh, from Africa or athletes of African heritage find these concepts easier to, to, to process and adopt and then to take action around. So our athletes are going to be more relevant for um, the next 20 or 30 years coming from Africa than uh, the European athletes, because all the data shows that that our children are looking for socially orientated, purpose-driven athletes, and 
obviously, uh, or at least in my opinion, Africa already has the most talented athletes when we talk about on the field. But now with the fact that we have the pretend, we have the, the most talented off the field in these areas, if we develop them properly, uh, really we have a, a, an even more remarkable opportunity. And, you know, I was telling you before that I, I, I'm, I'm hoping to come to, to Kenya soon to, to visit Elliot Kipchoge, who's probably my biggest uh, uh, role model uh, at the moment. And the principles and values by which that man lives his life are the blueprint, not for Africa, but for the world moving forwards. And, um, you know, what happens with the, with the Western media is that we continually um, dehumanize African athletes in comparison to the way that we tell the stories about um, uh, athletes in Europe or in America, even if they are African-American um, athletes. And so we need to do the job ourselves through the media about platforming our athletes as the purpose-driven athletes that they are, living their lives according to principles like Ubuntu. And I can't think of a better example than, than Elliot Kipchoge. But even with him, he doesn't have the profile or the awareness of some international athletes because we don't have the right media structures to tell our stories the way that we want to tell them on the continent with the, with the right cultural nuances and the right um, ability to look into the fine details of why our athletes are so exceptional. We allow it to fit into a... A, a kind of a European um, framework for telling stories on African athletes that, okay, you know, Sadio Mane, he supports his whole village and isn't that fantastic, but we don't get to understand the cultural context and relevance of that. And we don't position that cultural context and relevance as an export product. And what I believe is that a lot of these, um, you know, we need to get away from exporting our players and we need to export our football brand to the world. And our football brand is anchored in cultural constructs, which the world has a lot to learn from today. And that's where I believe that there's a huge opportunity, much, much bigger than uh, you know, any kind of player export model. It's the export of the underpinning value systems of, of Africa and African football, where um, the, 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 the model to generate revenues for the continent to develop its sports is more powerful. Just, just to uh, really come in very quickly there, um, I think he, uh, Tom uh, made a very powerful point there looking at not just selling players, but selling the brand, the brand of uh, you know, the, the, the African values. Um, the point that I think I'll just like to reiterate is this idea that there is an appetite now in the world. There is an appetite uh, for this new generation, these young people that want something more than just entertainment, they want purpose. They want connect. They want they want connection with other uh, human beings. So, if you look at the model that we have at Edu Sport and the model that is there in Ghana, the opportunity for a lot of young uh, uh, European students to come to Edu Sport. When they've gone back to their countries, they are not the ones that are involved in racism. They have an appreciation of the diversity of humanity. So when they go back to their, to, to their home country, they're not the ones that are going to be the, race, the, the, the racists because they have had an education that shows them an appreciation of the diversity of humanity. So that, that for me is a very powerful thing that, uh, you know, that we need to explore together. Um, in America, the American model of, of the student athlete is protected by powerful legislation. Uh, so the African Union, the African government, I want to appeal to you and I want to tell you that there's never been a better season than now to step up and have courage and start to protect your children. That is the calling of our forefathers and, and, and our foremothers of the continent, that we create policies at the African Union level that will protect these young athletes so that they, they, they are protected by the law. And, and, and then Ubuntu is going to flourish within that framework. Mm -hmm. Uh, very excellent points, uh, Tom and, uh, and Oscar. But, uh, you know, they're, they're always detractors. For example, um, when it comes to the, to the right to dream uh, model, um, some have said it's still a very closed, uh, closed space. You only pick uh, the best of, of the best, really, to be at the right to dream academy uh, in Ghana. Um, this kind of poses a challenge in terms of uh, accessibility. 
And how do you how do you now reconcile that with something like Ubuntu? I know your student athletes, uh, having watched uh, some of them, especially uh, Oseni uh, Buddha, they are really grounded. But this is somebody who has come all the way from Burkina Faso uh, to Ghana. How do you ensure he is safeguarded? Also, coming at that very tender age, uh, leaving his country, leaving his community. How do you reconcile that with uh, with Ubuntu, uh, with a, a system that is holistic and looks uh, to benefit the community, uh, Tom? I think that um, uh, first and foremost, uh, we've we've had many um, attempts to like broaden our impact and. Uh, as everybody knows, um, the, the the economic challenge of sports development in um, in in Africa is significant. Where where are you going to get the money from? And I think it's a little bit of what Oscar uh, talked about. And so, uh, for, from a pure pure sustainability level, we've uh, decided to focus on uh, one strand within the African football ecosystem, which is the most uh, talented boys and girls on the continent aren't getting the opportunities and platforms that they require. And that's where Right to Dream, that's the contribution that Right to Dream is making. But beyond that, especially into how does that feed into Ubuntu, you know, the clear educational policy and expectations of our students is that they replicate many fold the work that I've managed to do in building Right to Dream in the communities that they come from. And so, you know, and, and, and that's a, that's a, a, a tough um, tide that you have to swim against because, you know, the American dream, for example, is that you get to America and make it. The American dream isn't that you get to America, make it for a little bit and then go home. It's that you stay there and the wealth is created there. And so, you know, on many of these principles, you know, we... We work as hard as we possibly can to build educational curriculum and then support structures for our, for our students to be able to come back onto the continent and to either replicate the concepts of right to dream in the communities that they come from, or more importantly, to come up with the ideas that are most relevant to them. So I can give you a couple of examples. You know, Here, one of our um, graduates is now the head of character in in FC Norgeland, but he comes from Bukum, which, as every sports lover will know, is the spiritual home of boxing in, in, in Africa, it's where Azuma Nelson came from. And he was a, a, a street fighter before he got into football. And now he's uh, set up a, a program in, in Bukum called Bisisaka, which he, in, in, in English, calls Boxucation. And so he's using boxing as a, as, as a form of... Uh, of developing educational capacity in his community. And so that's the that's where the relevance of Ubuntu comes into the right to dream model, that um, this is not about um, developing footballers, selling them and saying, okay, good luck, go make your money. And if you change to a British passport or an American passport, we don't care. The reinforcement of identity and responsibility to the continent is where we, we play our role. Now, as we expand our brand, um, we, we have many conversations about how we can have that broader impact to pass our learnings and our education on to the wider community to replicate the work that Right to, right to Dream has done. Um, but that's where it comes into the need for more of a collective model because, um, you know, we, uh, 20 years ago, our turnover was, was $20,000 and it was just a bit of my salary going in to start this thing. And you know, today we turn over 25 million, which is 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 great in terms of development, but it's really a, still only a drop in the ocean in compared to, you know, the potential of the continent. So with that money, you, we run a professional club in Europe. We run a professional club in, in, in uh, a professional academy in Ghana, building a new one in Egypt, and then running a whole student athlete support structure in America. So I think we feel comfortable about the role that we play and, the ambitions we have to broaden it out, but the responsibility lies on our students who get the most um, you know, amazing opportunities um, uh, through our system to make sure that they really feed that back in and take development onto the next level. And I guarantee you, when you listen to a senior Buddha, uh, he's a hell of a lot more intelligent than, than, than me and definitely smarter than I was when I was 21. So I think that's kind of working, that we're going to have guys who – have bigger, better ideas than I do who can, I've told them their first job is to retire me. 
take right to dream on and then to replicate it into into their communities as as well so that's you know maybe my take on it but we certainly feel like um it hurts us that, that we don't have the capacity to expand and share our knowledge more than we do but it is a, it is a, a difficult process excellent how uh, uh, and in your case uh, oscar at, uh, at at edu sport you know how do you how do you continue to foster especially when it comes to to economic sustainability you mentioned that the answer some of the your players being um what do you call uh, being tapped and uh, you losing out on uh, uh, on revenues because running the kind of system or the kind of model that you're trying with edu sport also requires a lot of financial um uh, resources how do you ensure the sustainability of such a program without the right uh, investors in place here all right so the answer is we don't we you know the, the model is not sustainable for academies uh, I remember uh, in the early years when we first entered the, 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 the third division of the Zambian League, when we, when we had an opportunity to graduate to the second uh, uh, division, we stayed in the third. Reason was that in the third division, we didn't have to travel too far. We didn't have to suffer with, uh, uh, you know, having to pay for accommodation. So um, it, it's the realization that this, uh, football is a costly business. Now, I don't want to dwell too much on that because that's really the, the past. What I want to dwell on is, is the opportunity that we are seeing in the disruption uh, that maybe you know, we're seeing with the work that uh, Tom has done in, in Ghana. And, and, and there are other communities that are coming up across Africa. There is an opportunity now to be connected with people with a clear uh, unity of purpose. The purpose is, is not just a footballer, but it's a human being. So this human being, we're going to celebrate this human being when he achieves academically, when he's a, a community leader. So when we celebrate together, we are beginning to build a community. And, and then it becomes real. Then Ubuntu becomes real. Otherwise, Ubuntu becomes like, to borrow uh, Tom's uh, uh, you know, I I expression there, you're swimming against the tide. It becomes difficult to implement. You, you know, for you to find uh, an economically viable Ubuntu um, program, it's very, very costly. But with opportunity that is emerging now, um, we, you know, we, uh, over the past 20 years, we can start to think, what are the new relationships that we can, we can nurture that can propel us forward uh, with, with Ubuntu? What conversation can we start to have with government? We can go back to government and really put up a case to say, we need your support uh, because economically it's viable, but in terms of human uh, development, it is driven by this Ubuntu model, which is what we want uh, in our community. So there is, uh, yeah, there's definitely an opportunity to do something different here. And, um, you know, the, the model is definitely disruptive. Great. Maybe something, something Tom uh, touched on that uh, has just come back uh, to me and still on this uh, issue of educating. Now, educating now the wider continent through football. You know, football is a great convener, but... Africa has failed really to use the power of football to create uh, a positive, uh, to give a positive message. You know, uh, Tom talked about selling our, selling our brand. You know, everybody's watching football on the continent. But how are we using football to educate our people when they're all training their eyes on the, on the talents that we have exported? How do we use that platform to educate our people, for example, on something like Ubuntu. You know, it's very strange that we are talking about Ubuntu in a, on the Africa Football Business Show. And uh, some of our viewers really are, are appreciating that, showing that there is real, uh, there is real uh, potential. How do you get people like Osime Buddha to speak to a larger uh, audience? How do you get you, Oscar, to speak to a larger audience? You said, you know, we, not, we don't get uh, such a, a platform uh, regularly. How do, we, how do we bring in the media into this conversation and ultimately the support of institutions like the African Union and our governments? Uh, you know, I think it comes uh, down to the brand architecture. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, when Oscar says that the, um, you know, the, the commercial model around Ubuntu is difficult, uh, he's right, but only to a certain point, because if you take it to a certain level, it will become the most powerful 
commercial engine in the world because it's based on a principle of fairness and connectivity, whereas the capitalism that that we see operating, you know, currently is is based on a principle of exploitation. And so, you know, it, it, naturally, if we can lift it to a level um, where um, where it's accepted and principles of trade and, and engagement and fairness are based on on this principle, ultimately, with all the stuff we talked about before on on the 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 data and 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 what we're seeing about what our kids globally want for the next generation, they want to trade in these kind of constructs and they want to engage with fellow human beings on on a more fair level than you know than we've been used to and 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 Africa has certainly suffered more than anywhere on on those principles for you know for for many centuries so um i think that there's a there's there's a piece in terms of the brand architecture and 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 that brand architecture is what creates the education you know the the premier league or the or if we look at the american brands nba and nfl they do a lot of education all the time their messages are easy to disseminate to the country people understand the ideas so you know the, the the model is there for that to build the brand architecture it's just what are the principles of that brand architecture and you know even if we look at uh, america with nba and um, and uh, and nfl it's still a, a exploitative model with a charity uh, a, a charity element that, that, that they call csr um, which is you know isn't the principle of ubuntu ubuntu doesn't have any charity built into it mm-hmm. it says that i am because you are we're all on the level playing field even if you are materially more blessed than me i'm more blessed in other areas than you so mm. what i have i can exchange with you and these two things are as valuable to each other regardless of how capitalism might choose to 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 put more weight onto the material blessings of one person than another ubuntu doesn't doesn't uh, view things like that so the brand architecture of, of, of ubuntu um, is something which the African continent will find very easy to relate with, just so long as that it's packaged and distributed in the right way. And then, if that is delivered through the construct of our sports leagues, um, it's more natural that our that our fan base, which has a huge economic power, will start to look, as we saw with the European Super League, and say, "Well, at the end of the day, Man United they don't care about me anyway, and all they do is come down and put their logo on a bottle of." star beer or something and and think that that's engagement with the continent or we see all of this nonsense where clubs are trying to do uh, fee-paying academies all over Africa just to extract another few pesos out of uh, the African fan base while they're giving absolutely nothing back. And even uh, when it comes to the transfer market, then they, they don't even want to pay... Uh, any kind of market value for a player from Africa, whereas if that if that guy is playing in in London or or, or Brussels, then they'll go and pay tens of millions uh, uh, for them. So, you know that that model can't help Africa uh, develop. But this this brand ac- architecture of our sports leagues on the principle of Ubuntu, of course, for it to be a, a, a continental um, uh, a strategy, then it does require hundreds of millions of dollars, but you know, if the European Super League can go and raise, um, how much did they raise from uh, JP Morgan? I think three and a half billion dollars. Three and a half billion, yeah. Uh, then if we're talking about some concepts which have uh, architecture, which is going to speak to um, uh, 1.2 billion Africans and especially the five, 600 million that we have in the emerging middle class, then the economics are quite, are quite simple in terms of the business rationale for providing a product based on a value set that the African continent actually wants to engage with. So, um, you know, really it's just for me about, um, and and this is where I have to disagree in terms of taking these concepts to government. Um, You know, I believe that these concepts are going to be more successful in terms of uh, uh, private sector, uh, private sector driven initiative within the African framework Within the within the concept of Ubuntu, but you know, uh, uh, most of our ministries of sport in, in 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 Africa can't you know can't even afford to put on a a, a proper training camp for their national men's women uh, team, let alone the women's national team. So, I think all of this can be c- 
crafted within a private sector construct, but it should be crafted within the African private sector, and it should be driven by uh, African-owned businesses as sponsors and uh, African entrepreneurs as the as as the owners of these kind of concepts. Then I think uh, then then I think we have a chance. Uh, just to, just to uh, come in there very quickly, um, um, you know, when I said the role of government, I think the role of government has been defacilitating in these ecosystems because sometimes even if they don't have the resources, they come in and do policing of development as opposed to facilitating development. So this is this has to be an understanding that the government brings in. They have to come in as another stakeholder and other stakeholders who come from the private sector, others who come from in the public sector. So it's very important that we, we re-engineer our thoughts about what it means to work collectively yeah, so so um, we have this Ubuntu, which you know uh, rightly stated, uh, the African believes in that. So we don't have to teach an African to believe in that. We don't have to get African companies to 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 learn about corporate social responsibility and how Ubuntu comes in. It's part of their DNA. Now from there, we start to allow people that can create the architecture of the brand in that space. What are our people studying in universities? Are we just happy that somebody has got a degree in physics or are we encouraging innovation in those universities so young people can come to create applicable knowledge, knowledge that you know uh, prospers uh, the African continent? So the question that you asked, uh, Brian, about what do we do then uh, uh, going forward? Um, I think for me, it's the people, the people, the people. What the media does, the mainstream media has done historically, is that they've, they've had access to the people that the ordinary people did not have. So there was the, the ordinary people were, were not connected. There was disjointment within the community. Well, this opportunity we see here today that I'm for the first time connecting with Tom, I'm for the first time connecting with you, is because of the you know of, of social media and the internet. So these are opportunities that are presenting to people that were not. Uh, able to influence uh, positively. So we have the Ubuntu, we have the opportunity to, to access others that would believe in what we're trying to do. I believe that that, that is a huge step forward in terms of, 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 of fostering our, our agenda for you know, you know, humanizing football through Ubuntu. Excellent uh, staff, gentlemen. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for your, for your insight in, uh, on this topic. We really have uh, a lot of work to do. But uh, it seems it's all positive, very optimistic future for football uh, on the continent, for sports on the continent, and indeed uh, the, the, whole, uh, the whole continent. Uh, we are over time, so uh, apologies uh, for that. I think there is a lot more to share, and I hope uh, probably we'll have, uh, have another opportunity uh, to come back on the show and get into more detail about what is happening at Edu Sport, what is happening at Right to Dream. I know there is uh, Edu Move uh, that we also need to... Uh, to get going. So I'll, I'm open to inviting you again uh, on this platform uh, to share more about uh, what is happening. You know, some good developments I try to dream with the uh, investment from uh, Mohammed uh, Mansour. Looking forward to how that uh, develops in Egypt and, uh, and the UK. All the best uh, with that, Tom. So I'll just take uh, this opportunity to get uh, concluding uh, remarks. Since you're on, uh, Oscar, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll start with you and then we'll finish with, uh, with Tom Vernon. I just want to say that uh, we are in a new season. Um, we can look at the past and get depressed. We can look at the future and get excited with the opportunities that present. The Africa we want uh, is, is, is possible through uh, the models that uh, now are coming to fruition, uh, you know, through the work, for instance, that uh, Tom has been doing and that uh, many academies are doing across Africa. We need to step up the next level now. How do we brand these great works that we have? How do we begin to bring everyone together uh, using the modern technologies that present? And how do we begin to decolonize? How do we begin to believe that as a people, we can move forward. We, we are the ones we've been waiting for. We need to stop waiting for saviors. We are, the, we are our own saviors. So with those remarks, I want to congratulate you, Brian, and, and wish you all the very best with, your, with uh, you know, the African Football Business Show. Thank you. And, and good luck, Tom, as well. Best wishes. Thank you very much, uh, Oscar. Uh, Tom, we'll uh, finish with you. Yeah, no, I, uh, I just want to apologize at the start. I think Oscar did a much better job in, in praising you for um, the work that you've been doing, Brian. Um, 
and and the the conversations that you're framing. I'm, I, I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn, and I think that you're doing an excellent job there. And, and you know, part of the question that you asked about how we um, how we take things forwards and, and the media's role is, um, I think that you're a great example of, of of the solutions that we need and the conversations that we need to be framing. So uh, I thank you for inviting me on and and um, and say that your role is uh, at least as important as ours in in uh, finding some of the solutions that we've been um, uh, that we've been exploring here. Excellent, excellent, uh, gentlemen. It's been a pleasure to to host you uh, on this show. As I said, uh, you're welcome uh, anytime. I'm also open to ideas on how we can improve this. If there are topics you wish to share. I hope we can uh, we can keep in touch and uh, and keep uh, exchanging. Uh, today we did not have uh, much in terms of questions from uh, our audience, but a lot of uh, positive uh, uh, comments. Uh, you have been seeing them on the screen. So uh, thank you very much as well to our to our audience. Uh, again, one of the most uh, best attended uh, session, showing the interest that people have in the sport and uh, in the continent. Um, uh, to take things uh, uh, forward. So as a continuation to this, I think uh, the next show will be in, uh, in two weeks' time. We will have uh, a session on the future of football academies uh, in Africa. I think we're very well tied to what we have uh, uh, discussed uh, today. And uh, it is our hope that we'll have uh, yet another engaging uh, conversation. It all starts with the conversations, really. And uh, we look forward to actioning this not in 10, 15 years' time, but also immediately. As we speak, we also uh, do um, our level best to transform football and indeed the sports ecosystem uh, on the continent. So thank you very much, uh, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, have a nice evening. Have a good afternoon. Have a nice day uh, wherever you are. Uh, just to take this opportunity again to thank our sponsors who have made this uh, possible. That is uh, OTB Africa, uh, Parma Sports, and uh, the Sea Beyond uh, Leadership uh, uh, Forum. And uh, with that, I uh, wish you all uh, goodbye and uh, see you next time. That's in uh, two weeks' time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Uh. Bye-bye. Thank you.